Some days it's easy to get the fire going, some days it takes a little longer. <laughs> we, we welcome you to the first existentialist. Yes, dear. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the First Existentialist Congregation of Atlanta. We are very glad that each of you has chosen to be with us this morning. We invite you to turn. You will find on your seats or nearby both a multicolored hardcover and a softer covered paint songbook in the paint songbook. We invite you to turn to number 33 for our opening congregational song, which is This Little Life of Mine. We are delighted today to have with us Susan Otson as our pianist, and also harpist later on, and Don Erdman, who will be joining in on a couple of special numbers. So, please turn to number 33 and sing out.
Do we have any folks here who would like to introduce themselves? With the so, we invite you to stand and say your name and how you happen to find us and how you happen to be here this morning. So if you'd like, please feel free to stand. Yes, good morning. Georgia. I quit my job in December and hopped in my car and I've been traveling in the U.S. and I try to be at a new church every Sunday. So that's how I ended up here.
what one chooses to do internally is observed by an other, who then is able to define the other. In this way, one cannot be defined without an other. In this case, a close friend. When one loses their other, they also lose a large part of their identity and fall into despair, which leads to an existential crisis. Existentialism is the idea that one is defined through one's actions. What one chooses to do internally is observed by an other, who then is able to define the other. In this way, one cannot be defined without an other. In this case, a close friend. When one loses their other, they also lose a large part of their identity and fall into despair, which leads to an existential crisis. Please welcome Reverend Marty Keller for the power of existential friendship. Yeah, I think it did need to be said twice. <laughs> when you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand and nothing, whoa, nothing is going right, close your eyes and think of me and soon I will be there to brighten up even your darkest nights. You just call out my name and you know Writing about their relationship to the world, um, 
a friendship through letters. And then I texted a picture of the cover, which I forgot to bring with you, to my friend, my friend of more than 50 years, my friend Lisa, herself a writer of cookbooks, herself a gardener, herself a raiser of goats, proposing that our friendship was nearly the same as the mythical friendship in this novel between Louisa May Alcock and Emily Dickinson. I know that's presumptuous, but you know me. Right? <laughs> Only our friendship is real. It really is a friendship of two women who consider themselves somewhat literary, who consider themselves to be philosophically aligned. You see, a dozen years ago, I flew off to Trumansburg in New York via Syracuse on a narrow aisle, 50-seater plane, and I landed in that Spartan airport with just a sports bar, a pizza stand, and a candy gun and mass paperback bookstore. I got off that small, bumpy jet plane from Atlanta. I entered that mini airport, and I went down the one escalator to the baggage plane, suddenly panicking that I had landed in Schenectady by mistake. <laughs> and that my friend Lisa, my second college roommate in Stern Hall, UC Berkeley, California, 1966, would not be there to greet me. Because I was in the wrong place, right? I was in the wrong place. I was in the wrong city. And even if I were in the right city, I would not be able to recognize her. Because I had only seen a tiny Facebook portrait of her recently, and we had not seen each other in the flesh since shortly after I turned 21 years old. Wow. Lisa started school a couple of quarters late, straight from Southern California, Newport Beach, it turns out. Though at the time we roomed together, all I knew, or all I remember knowing, was that her father was a very famous physics professor at the university in Irvine, who eventually won a Nobel Prize, and that shortly after she moved in, she started spending a lot of time away from that tiny little dorm room. Truth be told, she spent most of her time away from that tiny little dorm room, from that retro all-women's dorm with the mandatory dress code and the sign-out curfew sheet, with whom I call her motorcycle boyfriend, John. My world then, when she was off gallivanting, going out the window with her boyfriend, John, seemed smaller somehow, but larger somehow. The up and down hill trek to Eshelman Hall, the sixth floor Daily Californian daily newspaper office, where there were manual typewriters, rimmed coffee desks, senior smoking cigarettes, editing half sheets of copy on cheap beige paper, me, a newbie in Underlun, a freshman assigned to put together the calendar with colloquium and underground foreign film screenings, all, all four years in an atmosphere of tear gas and riot fear. Lisa, who was then and is now a gifted artist and a nurturer of children and other living things, recalls that when she met me, she was feeling unformed. How many of you can relate? Unformed. And then when she found me perched on the edge of my narrow single dorm bed, almost folded in on myself in a moment of rare respite from the activities and stresses of my underground UC Berkeley campus life, that she thought, this is a woman, this is a girl, I was only 18, <laughs> whose life seemed passionate and real. And I thought from the moment that I met Lisa, that her life was passionate and her life was real. <laughs> From this first meeting came a relationship that has been after the very few months we actually moved together and the times we got together when we were still living in what she called the same quarter of the universe was almost entirely created and maintained through letters and occasional phone calls because it was before, long before texts and emails, before Facebook posts, Letters, actual letters that waxed and waned, 
letters handwritten on onion skin piping paper, on yellow lined paper, on handmade and drugstore note cards, cheap and then better quality computer paper, and only most recently cyberspace. Given the distance, the geographic distance between us, this was always the only way. Well, I graduated and I stayed in the Bay Area for more than 20 years after we last saw each other, and then we moved south. She moved in and then moved away with her motorcycle construction working brilliant guy, <coughs> traveling in Europe and then gravitating back east near to his family to upstate New York, where they eventually handmade their own house on a road called Rural Route One, which is now true Indian Port Road, where Lisa raised her goats and made her cheese and became a Montessori teacher and did her batiks. I, on the other hand, had my children, at least two of them, early and first naming my daughter, Alicia, Alisa, for her, writing a poem that was actually a recorded folk song with a chorus that described the difference between my life and the life of her namesake, my life friend, Alicia. Alicia, I want you to know that you were named for the journey I did not make into dairy land in sandals with farming books, a harp, and a loom, and a backpack full of dreams. The letters we wrote each other were filled with stories about our personal lives, musing, for example, about whether post-graduation we would actually be working in the same pancake house with our fancy degree. <laughs> How Lisa and John, who eventually became a husband, had to live for a while with a 60-year-old widow in a giant Victorian house, exchanging room and board for being her maid and her butler, her house cleaner, her handyman, her confidants, her surrogate children, eating spaghetti and butter with a side of macadamia nuts night after night. How I tried to fit my journalism and my poetry in with sick children, always sick children, endless housekeeping and city vegetable gardening. How glad we were both to see the 1970s decade end how peculiar it was, she wrote me, how we were tumbling into the 1980s with more hope, how I decided to divorce, how she decided to have children, the years when the correspondence trickled on one side or the other, one year me writing that, quote, there is no excuse for not having written you except a badly broken foot, a car arson, a move, and a second wedding. <laughs> Please write soon. We would both sign off. Take care. Take good care. It wasn't until 1991, 20 years after we probably last saw each other, that either one of us mentioned in our letters the extraordinary, you got to admit, the extraordinary outside events that surrounded our young adult years. Lisa writing me that her daughter, who was in the eighth grade, had watched the PBS series on the 60s and found it compelling, reminding her of when we first met and what she viewed as my daring journalistic ventures on campus and beyond. I don't remember the same thing, but the daughter. <laughs> Only in the first decade of this millennium did the names or names of presidents liked and detested appear on the pages of our letters. Letters of two women who were never indifferent about the goings on in the larger world, but the nature of our relationship, the texture of our friendship, has always been more like mutual touchstones, very personal, always there, constant and reliable, sources of nourishment and revival in times of drought, and celebrations in times of abundance and joy. As Beth Tephart wrote in her wonderful memoir about these special relationships, friendships super us. They fill in the blanks. They give us a purpose. Because, she reminds us, 
All friendships are finally mirrors. All friendships are finally mirrors. They provide proof that we exist, that we are these special others. They give us a reason to laugh as well as just to laugh at life flat out and keep going, stitched together over the years by talk and memories. Talk, 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 talk. Because in general, as Beth Kephart knows, adult friendships are not the same among women as among men. What do you think? Women talk, the cliche goes, while men revel in mutual doing. <laughs> Certainly this has seemed so to the men in my life, at least as I have observed them. My first husband had a would-be friend who died suddenly and young from a heart attack, leading me to write a poem observing that they may might have been friends in the way that men pretend to each other across the lunch table, slipping a private tale or two between the manila folders of their attache cases, marking a common for personal accounting, not loose tongue between clotheslines, but circling each other in an ancient ceremony of pride and territory. Friendships in bowling alleys, friendships on basketball courts, on hiking trails, shared male activity. According to Jeffrey Green, author of Buddy System, Understanding Male Friendships, while women might enjoy getting together over lunch, men are usually more comfortable meeting over a shared activity. When men meet, he says, they're not sharing. Often they're not sharing anything personal at all. So he tells a joke or a story about a man who goes over to his friend's house for a couple of hours and he comes home and his wife asks him about his friend's divorce, recent divorce, and the man says, it never came up. <laughs> we are told that friendships between men and women are different from same-sex ones, no one like the other. We all have circles of friends, friends from our childhood, friends from our religious communities, our neighborhoods, mothers and fathers of our children's friends, some longer lived and more significant than others. My mother said that friendships were for, for the road, a very short road. Friends like Joanne and Dee, I met them in my children's daycare, the athletic bright but not intellectual girls I would have felt so threatened by in high school and college. They were so much more comfortable than me, to put it mildly, on the tennis court swimming, jogging, or hiking, or in wet weather, sewing, and other handwork that always brought me to frustrated tears. Yet I gained so much from them as young wives and mothers whose concern for a time, for a time, were so like mine, and yet these backgrounds, their inner lives, were so, so very different. Now, the health-saving benefits of friendship have been the subject of scientific scrutiny even before COVID and the parallel epidemic of loneliness has spurred so much research about how damaging social isolation has been. There was an article published more than a decade ago in the New York Times by Tamara Parker Pope, who proposed, as she wrote, that in the quest for better health, many people, think about it, turn first to their doctors, or self-help books, or herbal supplements, overlooking what she wrote was a powerful weapon that might actually help them fight illness and depression, speed recovery, slow aging, and prolong their lives. Their friends, their friends. She cited a 10-year study in Australia that older people with a larger circle of friends were markedly less likely to die during the study period than those with fewer friends. In the same case, the reporter cited a study of nearly 3,000 nurses with breast cancer, which found that women without close friends were four times more likely to die from the disease as women with 10 or more friends. And it didn't make any difference how close these friends lived to them or how much contact they had. The friendship itself was protective. 
While much of the research has focused on friendships between women, some research has shown that men benefit too from these friendships, reducing the risk of heart attack and coronary disease, lowering their blood sugar, lowering their blood pressure, releasing mood elevating hormones. Out of this data has come a plethora, I love the word, plethora of practical how to advice about how to find friendship. Getting busy, getting out, joining fitness centers and dinner clubs, adult education, community volunteering, reaching out, extending invitations to dinner or a movie, phone calls, online messaging, support groups, neighborhood strolls, getting a dog to have a neighborhood stroll. You know about that one, too. Moving to co-housing communities where the chance of social isolation is hopefully less likely. Being part of a religious or philosophical community. <coughs> what columnist David Brooks recently called aggressive friendship. <laughs> what psychologists Michael Argyle and Monica Henderson have identified as faithfully engaging in some of the social actions on which our friendships are based. And what are these? Standing up for your friends when they're not around. Amen. Sharing important news with them on a regular basis. For confining vulnerabilities with them. Being generous, in other words, with our emotional, physical, and financial health in times of need. So why this growth industry for guides to true friendship in the 21st century? How many friends should we have? <laughs> Are friendships really diminishing in this country? You want to know? Data tells us for years friendship in America has been on decline, long before COVID. Three decades ago, 3% of Americans told the Gallup posters they had no close friends at all. In 2021, another poll put it at 12%. A recent New York Times article noted that about a year into the pandemic, 13% of women and 8% of men ages 30 to 49 said they lost touch with most of their friends. In other words, our young adults are really, really suffering this loss of friendship. According to the Survey Center on American Life, the percentage of Americans who say they don't have a single close friend has quadrupled since 1990. This, again, the study suggests that those people who have roughly exactly six or more friends are healthier and have higher levels of overall life satisfaction. In a newspaper article titled, Are 5,001 Friends Too Many? <laughs> British anthropologist Robin Dunbar was quoted as posing as a theory that the number of individuals with whom a stable interpersonal relationship can be made, be real friends, is guess how many? How many? Is it 5,001? Six. No. 150. <laughs> 150 seems like a lot of people. Lisa and me. 
Friendship where one writer observed the person gives you back the feelings you, you wish you could give yourself. And seeing the person you wish to be in the world. Seeing the person, really seeing the person you wish to be in the world. We used to call it unconditional positive regard from a precious other, a precious other who is our friend. Well, when I finally found my friend Lisa, and I did after a short time, at the bottom of the escalator in the Syracuse airport, the decades slipped away. We spent the next three days walking her country road, now paved and named, looking for egrets, drinking tea, drinking in the joy, the sense of being made whole. And still we text or talk now nearly every day, especially now in these COVID steeped, COVID suspended times, especially as we get older when so many of our friends are ill or dying or dead. And now in this world which is such hell, we talk or we text nearly every day. In the words of poet and spiritual teacher Andrew Harvey, coming to experience and celebrate the holiness of sacred friendship and to be grateful for the wisdom of your friends increases your faith in life. And isn't that an existential and feminist concept? Increases your faith in life and your capacity for skillful action. And from the poet Rumi, whatever fires the heart is a ray for my friend. May it be so.